Good morning. Actually, I guess it's uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Craig Harbour. I'm the Chief Operations Officer here at Fidelis Cybersecurity. Uh, and this afternoon's presentation is to cover uh, stack rationalization. Uh, just to give you a little background of myself, um, I've been the COO at uh, Fidelis Cybersecurity for, oh, about the last 18, uh, 20 months. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, 33 years at the National Security Agency, um, supporting both the Department of Defense and the intelligence community within the United States. In those roles, um, uh, predominantly supported defensive missions. Uh, I did have an opportunity in the last year and a half of my career uh, to support offensive operations as part of my role with U.S. Cyber Command. Um, you know, during that time, uh, stack rationalization, I guess, wasn't the in vogue term to use, uh, but was definitely a priority for the United States uh, military services and uh, the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And uh, I had an opportunity to work on a project that was known as NASCAR. Uh, it's now commonly referred to as Dodcar. But it really was kind of my first opportunity to really think through the challenges of stack rationalization. Um, I was given a task at the time uh, to take a look at the Department of Defense's large enterprises and the security stacks that had uh, been developed over time and really start to think through um, what it is that we needed to do to get the most out of those security stacks and uh, not knowing at the time, I really was going through a process of stack rationalization. So as we go through this presentation, I'll, I'll probably refer back to some of that work um, as I, I look forward to how does that work and the work that we're doing at Fidelis really lead us down a path to, to really set a methodology or an approach to really think through how do large organizations, large agencies, large companies who essentially have built up cybersecurity stacks that now consist of products anywhere from, you know, 30, 40, 50. Uh, you know, I've talked to companies recently that have built stacks over 100 different products. How do we make sense out of that? And essentially, how do we look at uh, really uh, reducing the footprint and, and increasing the efficacy out of what we provide today. So if I can, and, and I apologize to this audience in advance, even though I, you know, I've done presentations forever and I've been told not to apologize. Um, in this case, I will. Um, the first couple charts are really just to make the case. And, and I suspect that everybody in this audience is aware of kind of the state of reality here, right? Which is, you know, breaches happen and, and the cost impacts are, are high. Uh, and, and there's kind of two, two parts to this chart, right? The left side part of the chart, you know, you can pull this kind of stats really from any of the Verizon reports that are out there or the Poneman uh, Institute charts. And, and they basically make the case on um, the fact that, you know, for years, you know, cybersecurity professionals have really architected systems. We've looked at, you know, traditional systems that had a perimeter defense. Uh, we've looked at zero trust. Uh, we're continuing to evolve kind of our approach to securing various environments. Yet, unfortunately, breaches continue to happen. And I'll at least put my spin on it. Uh, despite the best efforts, I think, of security professionals uh, today and even going forward, it really is a, a non-ending or ever continuing challenge of uh, how to best defend, realizing that the attackers, our adversaries, are really putting in the same level of effort themselves to look at opportunities to defeat whatever defensive mechanisms that we put in place. Um, as, as pointed out here, the costs are significant, right? Uh, and I, I, I don't need to probably tell anybody in this audience, um, but cyber dwell times are, you know, not measured really in terms of hours and minutes, but they're turned, uh, you know, measured in months and days um, and, and sometimes longer than that, right? The cost associated with that cleanup uh, once a breach has um, uh, been determined and uh, 
you know, they're significant in the, in U.S. dollars. It's eight million dollars is the average cost today. The right side of this chart, I think, is just as interesting. Um, the fact is that uh, there was a survey done by our organization last year by our threat uh, research team. And what came back was just as surprising with all of the investments that have been made by various agencies, organizations, companies. The fact that there's a lack of confidence in those defenses, I, I find uh, just as interesting. And that lack of confidence, as you can kind of read from the bar graph, really is based on a number of things that I think are critically important. The fact of they don't have the visibility, right? They don't really understand all of the products that, that they have within their, their infrastructures. They don't know how they're configured. Um, they may not uh, be able to patch them properly. Uh, there may be uh, other environments that are out there as shadow um, uh, networks that are out there. And really having a total visibility of every device that exists, both the devices that they put, um, you know, uh, like endpoint detection capabilities where they're actually putting software on the device versus those devices that they don't manage. So it's kind of the managed, unmanaged uh, device problem. And as you can see, um, there's a number of areas they talk about insider threat detection, countermeasures. Uh, all of these things are important as you really start to think through what should my cybersecurity stack look like uh, and, and what is it that I need to have in order to be confident in, in the defensive capabilities. Uh, so with that, let me just start with a, another chart that I think uh, should not be surprising to everybody. When you start to think about a cybersecurity stack and you think about the analysts and the operators that are essentially essentially maintaining that stack, uh, using that stack to collect information, to get an understanding of what's happening within the environment, and really to be able to take uh, action against what they see. I think there's uh, the bullets here, I think really are my summarization, which probably are pretty close to what I suspect most people in the audience would be thinking as well. I think very clearly, our SOCs are uh, overwhelmed with the, the number of alerts to triage and the investigations to conduct. Um, and you can just start to think about, and I'll use the DOD, the Department of Defense for the United States. Um, many of their cybersecurity stacks are 75 plus different uh, vendor products that are sitting within there performing different functions. Um, just imagine all of the alerts potentially coming back from that uh, cybersecurity stack and trying to figure out how to prioritize and which actions to essentially work. Um, there's a lack of full visibility of devices on the network with no contextual understanding of threats. And this goes back to, I, I think, my earlier comment on the last chart. Uh, we have a number of our devices that are managed and there's a number of devices that are unmanaged. All of those uh, devices create paths within our environment that potentially can be exploited. And to the extent that we don't have good visibility, uh, it really allows the attacker an avenue to access and essentially gain foothold within our environments and then to be able to move laterally towards their, uh, their target, right? To look for um, what is that important data, for example, that they want to go after and to exfiltrate and, and look for essentially what are the, the paths to do that. Um, the concept of more data isn't better. Uh, it's about getting to the right data. So again, it goes back to, you know, if you think about the, the large number of devices within a security stack and the data, the telemetry that's coming back, uh, how do you make sense of that data? What data is most critical to getting to a point of actionable alert, right? So that I get a understanding what's happening and I can make a decision. So think about the idea of sense making. How do I make sense of the data? Um, and what are the questions that I'm trying to ask, right? Um, and, and if I had the answer to those questions, uh, think then not only about the, the detect of capability, but also think about response actions. What am I gonna do when I know the answer to a particular question? 
Um, cybersecurity tools lack integration, automation, slowing down response times. I think this is pretty typical for most of the stacks that, that I had looked at over time, uh, especially prior to the introduction of SOAR products, uh, the secure orchestration automation response capabilities, right? Uh, it's not surprising that you have 75 or more different products. They each have their own different management system. Um, they're providing data back, but they weren't integrated and automated together. They were using separate threat intelligence. Um, and so that lack of integration and automation really leads to a lot of manual responses, right? Human intervention within that decision cycle. Ultimately, that means slow, right? The human brain can only process so much and it really needs the assist of automation tools and the better integration of the, the, the sets of products that exist within a cybersecurity stack. Um, the next to last one, probably not a shocker to anybody in this audience as well. Organizations lack skilled resources to really kind of, uh, you know, work through all of that telemetry, all those different tools, those management systems to try to really get full situational awareness. So, so what is going on within the network and then um, kind of making and formulating and understanding, understanding the context and then being able to take action. So as a result, um, you know, complex, sophisticated attackers, and, and they're everywhere today. Uh, you know, it's, it's Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, it's Iran, right? There are a lot of uh, terrorist groups that are out there. Again, the skill sets um, and the sophistication and the complexity of the attacks that they're running, um, they can remain inside our networks for months without detection. So what's critical is to come up with a strategy uh, that doesn't just throw a product uh, against the problem, but really understands really how does the attacker think and how to use that as part of the process to really think through rationalization of those cybersecurity stacks. So there's a lot of different approaches out there. Um, I have shown at least one here, which is really in order to be able to think like uh, an attacker, that's the way we're going to gain the decisive advantage. And so, you know, in the background of this chart, and unfortunately, I didn't really have it in the build mode. So I'm just going to describe what's there. I really started to think about uh, the problem, you know, 10 years ago when I was working this for the National Security Agency uh, in support of the Department of Defense of, hey, lots of different products out there. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, you know, acquire a product to solve a problem, acquire a product to solve another problem. We didn't really have a framework to think about the problem holistically. And so in the background of this chart, and I'll, and I'll show it a little bit later on, uh, is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It's one of several frameworks that, that exist. I think it's gained a lot of popularity um, within uh, the commercial world as a way to think about uh, the attacker and the tactics and the techniques that they use. And they really become, if you will, the techniques are the building blocks of an attack or it's the DNA of an attacker. And so the idea is that if you were to look at the, the MITRE attack is the exemplar for today's discussion, uh, from initial access to exfiltration, kind of working across the framework from left to right. The reality is as the attacker essentially uh, breaches our uh, enterprises, uh, which is kind of represented on this chart by the kind of the left axes, um, they try to work themselves over to what I refer to as impact. So from the time they breach the system, until they impact, uh, and the impact could be exfiltration of data. It could be, um, you know, damaging critical infrastructure, uh, lots of things that they can do. Uh, and the goal really of the defender is to try to reduce that cost and that risk to remediating by detecting earlier in the attack life cycle. So I think by better understanding how attackers think and how the attacker does their job, uh, our objective as defenders and as we are thinking through stack rationalization is how do we essentially engage the attacker earlier in that life cycle? 
Uh, and again, start to think about detect and respond equally. And as part of the detection, think about artificial intelligence, machine learning as a means to essentially understand that attack sequence much sooner in the process. And, and I say that um, because quite frankly, the attackers are also using those same type type of technologies to essentially improve the effectiveness of their attacks. So in order to counteract what they're doing, we need to also employ um, those types of detection capabilities. And so machine learning, artificial intelligence, not just for detect, but for response, because being able to respond uh, in a time where you're actually inside the decision cycle of an attacker, to me, is part of that effectiveness of being able to gain the decisive advantage. So from Fidelis, we look at it from really what's needed is this whole idea of holistic visibility um, and extended detection and response capabilities. That is going to be core to being able to really gain the decisive advantage as we look through and think about stack rationalization. So um, very quickly, um, and I, I'm only going to talk to these, uh, I'll say, uh, key tenants that are shown here, the five key tenants, because as you're starting to think about the stack and the rationalization of the stack, I think it's important that there's some um, basic capabilities that are afforded by that stack. Um, and the very first thing, you know, when we talk about visibility, it's really know your network better than your attacker. Uh, realize that the attacker is going to spend 80% of his time or more really doing reconnaissance and planning. And, and what, what we as I think defenders don't want is to have a, an attacker who has a better understanding of our networks than we do. And so that's where, again, the idea of holistic visibility, that you really understand all the paths, where all the assets are, what assets are managed, what assets are not managed, where is those that critical uh, data, where are those critical systems, and making sure that we have the right uh, instrumentation that allows us to do the appropriate detections and responses and again, think about how does that equate to defeating the attacker earlier in the life cycle? Uh, understanding the attacker's motives and objectives. And again, to me, uh, I think, and, and you'll see this in the next several charts, I use the MITRE ATT&CK framework in this particular presentation. But have a framework that allows you to understand attackers, how they behave, the types of attacks that they've used, and you're going to start to see that there is a, I'll say, set of core capabilities that all attackers seem to leverage. And, uh, you know, we can take advantage of that as defenders and use that to help prioritize some of the um, capabilities that we want to put in place, again, as we're thinking through the rationalization. Uh, engage the, tire, the attacker uh, prior to impact, again, is... You know, the sooner that we can detect and respond and remediate, the less risk we have. So that as you're looking at defensive capabilities, look at that left side, uh, left side of the MITRE attack framework. What are those things that we can detect early on in the sequence and essentially remediate the, remediate the attacker before they get too far or before they establish the foothold and, and essentially lay dormant within our networks, you know, for, you know, attacking at a time and place of their choosing. Decide and act, attack, uh, or decide and act faster than the attacker really gets to uh, my earlier comment about integration and automation. I think that's a key uh, capability. So it's not just the ability to, if you will, detect and respond. Um, it's respond and, and it's how quickly you can do that, right? Uh, again, prior to impact. And the last one really is uh, more of a proactive measure, but I think it's critical as we look at modern defenses is not to just sit back on our heels, but the ability to shape the attacker's experience. And what I mean by that is, you know, the attacker spends a lot of time, uh, as I mentioned, planning, uh, doing reconnaissance on our networks. If we can change dynamically the perception of what they view as the attack service, 
and think about using uh, deception technology, decoys, uh, breadcrumbs, lures, anything to trip up the, the attacker. Uh, the reality is that significantly increases the cost and the risk and the complexity of their uh, essentially efforts. So again, those are, you know, if you, if you will, five things that I think are key tenants as we're looking at stack rationalization and we're looking how best to defend our networks. So with that, um, it's time to really rationalize our security stack. And, and so let me just make some observations of some things that I saw in prior work and that I would suggest to you that as you're thinking through a methodology on how do I essentially reduce my security stacks, I mean, and I understand this, you're, you're not uh, any different than anybody else. Um, I use DOD as an example, but what I found is that what I thought was somewhat an absurd number, 75 different products, Pretty consistent what I've seen uh, in my limited time uh, working more closely with commercial customers. You know, I, I would say that the, the numbers are probably anywhere from 40 to 110, 120. And so, you know, is as you're thinking through that, uh, let me be very honest. Uh, I, I think uh, you really need to think about a trusted advisor or somebody as a system en engineer helping you think through step one, which to me is understand the value of your current investments, right? Um, and, and I think about those in a couple different ways. Uh, you know, you have probably in the case of the DOD, 75 different products, um, but how well or how much of those products is, is being utilized today? Uh, during the assessment that we did roughly 10 years ago, what we found is because products were being deployed uh, to essentially solve uh, one-off problems, um, we may have only turned on, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40% of the features of a particular product. Um, and, and the rest of the features were never utilized. Uh, and, and think about doing that uh, time after time after time how much redundancy and capabilities was already purchased, but never really leveraged. So I think the very first step uh, in stack rationalization is to understand the value of what you already own, right? How well can it pr protect? How well can it detect? How well can it respond to essentially adversary behavior? Um, and when I talk about adversary behavior, you're going to see that uh, as I go through this presentation, I'm going to use the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, there are other frameworks out there. If you um, are prefer those frameworks, use those frameworks, but be consistent in using that as a way to think through and understand how attackers behave and how well can your existing systems provide coverage against those, understand where your gaps are, uh, where you have duplication and use that as an opportunity to do that first layer of stack reduction, right? So what I mean there is that if I looked at all the products that exist within a security stack and I turned on all of the features, fully utilized what I've already paid for, how much duplication do I have? What can I remove out of my existing cyber security stack and not impact the efficacy of the solution that I offer today. To me, that's step one. Uh, part of step one is by going through that and using the MITRE framework as an example, I'm also gonna identify where I have gaps. And those gaps are going to lead me to what products or products should I be uh, acquiring to essentially fill those gaps. All right, so that's kind of the big step one. It's three of those bullets. I kind of lump them together is that's step one. Um, step two for me really is taking that understanding of what do I already own and looking for how do I have fortify really those, uh, what, I, what I consider in most cybersecurity stacks to be reactive, reactive capabilities with more predictive and proactive capabilities where I'm really trying to uh, understand earlier in the attack cycle, right? Start to predict things and defend earlier in the attack cycle. And part of that can be through proactive measures such as deception technologies. 
So again, it's really a full complement of capabilities that need to be part of that end solution. Uh, and as we've mentioned several times, integration, automation, and sharing intelligence, uh, threat intelligence across those products, that's really gonna get us to that point of, you know, if you really wanna be able to operate inside the, um, the attacker's decision cycle, you need that speed in which to do that. And part of that speed is, hey, I gotta collect the right data. That right data of who, what, when, when, where, when, and how, right? Understanding contextually what's happening so that my responses are appropriate. So I have actionable alerts that I, that I can essentially take action on and really defeat the attacker uh, in mid-step. So I, you know, I've mentioned several times uh, there are other attack frameworks. I, I kind of highlighted the MITRE attack because that's the one I'm going to talk about. Uh, there is the Lockheed Martin kill chain. There's the NIST um, cybersecurity framework. Uh, there's other frameworks out there. I included the uh, framework that I worked on as part of NSA. Uh, it's now referred to as Dodd-Car. There's a variant of it uh, referred to as GovCar. But again, the, the idea of the framework, it's really to, an approach to standardize the lexicon so that we have a, a common understanding when we talk about attackers and the techniques that they use, that we have a basis to communicate from. Um, and so again, it's, uh, you know, pick one. Personally, don't care which one you pick. Uh, I, I would highly recommend you consider the MITRE attack framework because I think they do a really good job of providing a lot of insight um, and, and for those who that haven't seen it, um, I, I just grabbed a screenshot of the MITRE ATT&CK Navigator page. If you haven't been there, I um, suggest you do a, a quick review of it. They do a really nice job of really trying to simplify the understanding of what I refer to as kind of the building blocks of an attack or the DNA of an attacker. And as you can see, going from left to right, uh, initial access, working all the way through exfiltration, um, the, the tactics, if you will, are at the top, at the highest level. Uh, the techniques, the various techniques for initial access or execution, uh, et cetera, you can see that are there. Uh, and for each of those uh, within the uh, Navigator page, you get a detailed definition that's been captured uh, along the way that really, you know, can help bring up your understanding of the individual techniques, as well as they, they show how those techniques are, are brought together in a, you know, uh, by an attacker to actually execute their attack. Um, and again, that gives us now a framework to think about, given that the attacker is using these techniques to defeat our systems, what do we have in place as part of our security stacks to be able to defend? And so with that, um, I, again, I, uh, I kind of borrowed a few screenshots and, and apologize for the fact that they're, they're smaller than I thought they were when I, when I dropped them into the, the presentation. But I think one of the things that you can do by really understanding the MITRE ATT&CK framework in understanding individually the various attacks that have been used over time. Um, one of the interesting things is that you can start to overlay the attacks one on top of another. Uh, and this is very, uh, this is kind of a very simple comparison, looking at uh, APTs 28 and 29, right? And you can see that 29 is represented by yellow, 28 is represented by blue, and the common techniques that both attackers are using are in green. So think about that. Now, what if we add it on, you know, FIN7, Carbonac, think of all the various attacks that are out there that we have seen uh, in the wild. Um, you could actually create what I would call a threat heat map. Um, and the intensity of the colors probably wouldn't pick yellow, blue, blue, green, but probably would pick something like red um, in various shades of red, where you start to see that commonality, those are gonna be priorities as you start to think about your resource investments and your cybersecurity stack and the rationalization of the stack that you wanna make sure 
that the products that you're selecting for your cybersecurity stack have the ability to detect and, if appropriate, to respond to any one of those particular techniques. Um, again, ideally, uh, you would want to have coverage against every technique within the framework. I understand there's a reality to that so that if you need to prioritize, use the, the framework as the way to really think through that process. The other um, uh, view that I, uh, I borrowed from this, uh, I thought was interesting, is there's a, um, uh, a view within the MITRE ATT&CK uh, uh, site within Navigator that really takes then the individual techniques uh, for a, a particular advanced persistent threat. And what's shown here is for APT29. And they actually have a, um, a view that will show you how they're sequenced in time in the execution, the attack. But what I thought was just as interesting is they also identify what data sources would you want to be able to have access to in order to be able to detect that particular technique? And then what are the possible mitigations that you would want within your system to be able to defend against that? And so this is kind of a, an interesting view of the way they essentially provide that information, kind of in a visual format, but it's also in a textual format as well within the Navigator page. But again, as you're starting to think through rationalization, making sure that you're instrumented properly in order to collect the right data to understand what's happening within your network, and making sure that you have mitigations available to essentially remediate potentially what the attacker is trying to do. And again, to the extent that that can be automated, uh, that's the, that will improve. Uh, and this last view that I, that I pulled from their, their site really was again, mapping threats to capabilities. And so earlier when I had mentioned the first step of stack rationalization is, Hey, what capabilities do you already have investments for versus what capabilities are gaps? So view it for the sake of this is white is, uh, they're, they're my gaps. Um, the various colors of blue show intensity in my capabilities. Um, and then if you overlay this with the, the notional threat map that I was sharing above, it's really going to help you prioritize that coverage. Where do I have coverage mapping up, if you will, of my threats to my capabilities? And for those high priority techniques that an attacker is using, make sure that as you're building out your cybersecurity stack, those capabilities are covered first. Um, and, and then use uh, additional investment to essentially grow the capabilities. Um, let me also make sure that, that I say this because I, I know I didn't say it before. Um, you know, the MITRE ATT&CK framework, like all the frameworks, are a list of the techniques that are known today. The reality is attackers will continue to uh, identify or create new techniques and we need to be just as, um, you know, in, in looking for those techniques and capturing those and documenting them. So the MITRE ATT&CK framework, like all the frameworks, are really a, it's a living document. And it's something that you're constantly reassessing your capabilities against. So as you're looking to mature your, your environment, your defensive capabilities, realize that the framework is, is purely a framework. And it is a living framework and you need the ability to continuously monitor and monitor in real time uh, the capabilities uh, under detection and, and being able to do that in a way that allows you to also kind of keep pace with the attackers as they continue to evolve their capabilities. So from a Fidelis standpoint, you know, when we look at our product and we think about the MITRE ATT&CK framework, uh, we also understand that, um, you know, like anybody that's out there selling a product, uh, we have a, a, you know, a network detection and response capability. Uh, we have an endpoint detection and res response capability. We have a deception capability, right? So, so we have really three products in one within our platform. 
Some of our customers may actually acquire all three as part of the platform, or they may feel they already have an, a, you know, an appropriate endpoint detection response and they may go with another vendor. So we felt it was important that as we were doing an assessment of our product uh, as part of the process of doing stack rationalization, that we could share with our customers where we have coverage, where we don't have coverage, and we also map them to what products within our platform um, provide that coverage. So for example, you know, uh, endpoint uh, coverage is provided by Yellow. Uh, I believe it was the network product is the uh, blue, and our deception uh, capability is within red. Uh, where we have, uh, you know, overlapping coverage where network, for example, uh, overlaps with uh, endpoint in providing coverage, that is green within this chart. So, and, you know, there's kind of the use of primary and secondary colors. I, again, I know it's difficult to read, but the idea here really was as part of stack rationalization, when you engage a vendor after you really understand what capabilities have you already invested in, you've done that first level of analysis. Then you want to look at a vendor's product and say, where do I have, uh, where does it fill gaps that I have? And also, where is it um, that it may provide better capabilities? Uh, I may have a better solution for endpoint detection and response, or it's a better coverage for network detection and response. Right, so there's another round of, if you will, what if analysis that uh, that you can do as you're going through that rationalization where, you know, you may have had, and I'll use the example 75, if I fully utilized all those products, maybe I got it down to, I don't know, maybe 60 different products because there was duplication. Um, maybe I can bring in a product, product like a Fidelis Elevate and maybe I can significantly bring it down because it covers, as you see, it covers a large portion of that map. That's not to say that you don't want some duplication, but I think it has to be thoughtful duplication. So that as you're doing this, you're actually kind of building out a story that really allows you to understand the efficacy of the stack that you're going forward with. And it's based on a methodology and the methodology we're recommending is using the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And, you know, so as a case study, we recently supported a customer uh, who, who had a very large cybersecurity stack. Uh, their cybersecurity stack was well over 50 or 60 different products. Uh, and their challenge was, hey, uh, could you reduce our stack to 12 products in 12 months? Um, and our answer was absolutely, right? Um, and, and, and we used the methodology above to make the case that we could do that and really thought through what did they already have? What were we bringing to the table with our Elevate platform? And we were able to get them to, I think it was 13 products, not 12, um, within 12 months. And the idea was that if you will, and this is kind of probably more at a marketing level, but just to kind of make the kind of the point, if you think about some of those core capabilities that, that you would expect, and those are represented in the grays and greens on this chart, and you think about the different vendors that you may have within your cybersecurity stack today, the reality is you probably could reduce that footprint just by understanding that relationship between those features as well as how those would map to a MITRE ATT&CK framework. And so for a kind of a very simplistic standpoint, if you think about some of those major functions or capabilities that are grays or greens today, the greens really represent what we at Fidelis believe that we can cover as part of that holistic capability. The grays are areas that we acknowledge, hey, we're not the experts in those areas, but as we're building out a rationalized stack, uh, we're not a firewall, and you know, we think a firewall is an appropriate uh, part of that solution. We would go and partner with a firewall vendor as part of you know, delivering a, if you will, a rationalized stack. So again, this was a um, kind of very quick, um, I'll say high level, try to 
bring this together, but but we've done this as part of stack rationalization. We are working with our customers today. We are using the MITRE ATT&CK framework as the basis to think through that rationalization of the stack. And we take the steps that I mentioned above and we walk customers through that. And we would be more than happy to sit down with anybody uh, within this audience and, and you know do kind of a deeper dive on, on how do you really do that and how do you measure that efficacy and how do you do that in a transition uh, approach? So, so how do you rationalize a stack, reduce the footprint while at the same time not impacting your business operations or your missions and doing that so that you maintain that uh, capability as the stack is being reduced? Uh, so with that, I, I will open it up to questions and knowing that this has been recorded, um, I'm actually, uh, uh, you know, connected in virtually. And so, um, yeah, so uh, whatever questions, let's uh, let's take them.